Hi, I'm Val Curtis and welcome to another Friday Harbor Live. Um, thank you for joining us for another episode where our brilliant and talented Islanders are sharing their skills and stories with Island kids of all ages. We want to put out a little PSA for you because so many Islanders are feeling like the stress and anxiety of the past few months is weighing heavily on them. And given financial concerns, many people may feel like they can't afford counseling right now. The good news is that we have some great and accessible resources on our island. If you have Washington Apple Health Insurance, behavioral health support is available at our local Compass Health office. You can call 360-378-26. Six nine for more information, and I'm going to pop that right into the comments there for you. Um, in addition, if you have health insurance with a big deductible, or if you have no health insurance at all, the Family Resource Center's Community Wellness Program may be able to provide you with easy and affordable access to counseling and behavioral health support. Their program can connect you with a wide variety of local private practice therapists to choose from. Fees for counseling are income-based and typically range from $5 to $25 per session. Participation in the program is totally confidential, so give a call to the Family Resource Center to find out more. And again, their number is 378-5246. And of course, with a little 360 in the beginning, I'm copying that right into the comments now as well. So you have that information ready for you. Um, as you know, we love to feature our local Islanders and we've had such an amazing array of people so far. But let me tell you, I am so excited about this guy who decided to join me today. And I'll tell you a little bit about our story and how we connected initially um, right after I bring him on in here. So if you would please in, you know, we like our three, two, one. Three, two, one. Oh, that way. I will never get that right. Hi, Bob. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. And so the story goes that you were in Mexico. Right. Over 13 years ago. <laughs> right. We were just putting the marker on that one. And you got a call. Right. <laughs> from the from Court Bill, who was the... Uh, middle school principal at the time it's right. true and he had a major ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, did. He, he did he said uh, would you come and be mrs curtis <laughs> yeah I said, well i can't be mrs curtis but i'll come <laughs> and i was so grateful you did so you took i think it was like six weeks that you took over my class right because i was busy having a baby Right. <laughs> and we know the timeline because he just turned 13. So, <laughs> so that was great. And you did such an amazing job with those kids. I was so grateful. It's, as a teacher, um, before you have kids, your students are your kids. They're your right. babies. And so it was hard for me to hand my babies over to someone. <laughs> but it was easy to hand them over to you. Well, and you had it very well organized and lesson plans and end of the year uh, activities. And it, it was it was a joy. Oh, thanks. And so what have you been up to, Bob? It's been a while. Well, uh, I retired from teaching and uh, I was living on San I was splitting my time between San Juan Island and Mexico. And then I uh, moved to Port Townsend. And I've been here about uh, 12 years now, and I really like it. But my heart is always on San Juan. I'm, I'm a fifth generation Islander on both my dad and mother's side of the family. Whoa, I didn't realize that. Yeah, the guards and the sandwiches. Oh, so I did not realize you had the sandwich line. Oh, yes. That's my mother. Hey, okay. And so today you are going to share a little bit with us. Yes, yes. And so I um I don't want to 
want to hear from me. They want to hear from you. So I'm <laughs> going to scoot out and you take on over. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Val. Good. Always good to chat. <laughs> good okay. To uh, well, I, I, like I said, my name is Bob Gard and uh, I was born and raised on San Juan Island. Uh, I was born in a farmhouse at the north end of Beaverton Valley. It is the, it was a, uh, the guard homes. It wasn't a homestead for the guards. It was homesteaded, and the guards bought it at the very north end of Beaverton Valley. And they had actually two separate farms with two separate uh, farmhouses and uh, barns and outbuildings and everything. The original guard was Paul Guard, and he uh, came with his family from Kansas in 1889 and purchased the homestead. And on my mother's side, the Sandwiths, they came, they were earlier, they came out of England uh, in 1861 and went to Victoria for five years. I kind of think they worked for Hudson's Bay Company. And then in, uh, probably to pay off their passage, maybe. I know that the voyage was six months from uh, Liverpool, Pool, England to Fort Victoria on Vancouver Island around South America. And they, uh, in 1867, they came to San Juan and they settled out by uh, American camp uh, and had a, I, I'm not sure, I don't think it was a homestead because there was, it, it wasn't decided who owned the islands at that time. It was right in the midst of the pig war and the joint occupation by the British and the Americans. I know when the, as soon as the uh, uh, settlement came down, the arbitration in 1872, uh, the Sandwiths along with a lot of other Brits that had established uh, on San Juan hustled right over to, to uh, Port Townsend and uh, applied for American citizenship so that they could gain owner, legal ownership to, to the land that they had settled on and had been working for a number of years. Uh, before I get into the, uh, uh, before I get into the uh, island history, I'd like to talk about Native American history in the San Juans. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, for thousands of years, probably 3,000 years prior to contact with, with European peoples, uh, that San Juan Island and islands were uh, home to Native peoples. And uh, it was a pretty good, pretty good lifestyle. Mother Nature was pretty good to them. They had the uh, Salish Sea and they had... Uh, you know, the marine resources of fish and, and, uh, and then they had abundant natural resources uh, on land, including the cedar trees and, and uh, which they, you know, stripped the bark off and wove into clothing and made baskets and dug uh, canoes out of the uh, cedar, uh, cedar logs. And uh, so uh, Mother Nature was really pretty good and they, um, they found secluded, uh, protected uh, spots to uh, settle. I know that there was a big settlement at English camp that's been excavated archeologically for uh, this was three or four times and they found a lot there. Uh, so they had uh, they had long houses made of split cedar planks. So that there was another use of the cedar tree. Uh, they they were uh, Mother Nature was good to them. In in contact time, uh, not so good for them. They didn't get any permanent uh, land base in the San Juans. Um, there was a group called the Mitchell Bay tribe and they they tried to organize and, and get recognition from the federal government and were unsuccessful. The Chevalier family was 
instrumental in part. Charlie Chevalier was very instrumental in that. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, contact time was tough for Native Americans, but prior to that, I think they had it pretty good and uh, and thrived and uh, and uh, it took a it took good uh, good avail of a very abundant environment that allowed them to uh, have a lot of resources to enhance their life. Um, in contact uh, with the, the islands, white contact, uh, European, American, British, came, uh, I think the impetus is, is, was uh, actually the gold rush to the Fraser River Canyon in the late 1850s, in the 1850s. A lot of men came through the San Juans uh, on their way to that event. And uh, when it didn't pan out for them, many of them, but not a, a, a fair number of them came to the San Juans and became permanent settlers. So their impetus was, was the gold there. And then they didn't make it, or they did, and what they, the resources they had, they came back to the San Juans and settled and became permanent, permanent settlers. You know about the pig war between the, the uh, Hudson's Bay pig. The Hudson's Bay Company uh, had had a considerable uh, activity on uh, the south end of the island, uh, they had sheep farmed uh, called Bellevue Farms, and it was a Hudson's Bay subsidiary. And they had sheep pastures uh, throughout the island, and uh, that was their activity. But, you know, it was unclear as to who owned the island islands because of the discrepancy in the Oregon Treaty of 1846 in the said the main channel will be the dividing line. Well, the language was ambiguous because there's two, two uh, channels. There's De Hero Strait and there's Rosario Strait. If they met Rosario Strait, San Juan Islands would be British. If they met De Hero Strait, it would be American. And so they had the flare up for after the uh, an American settler by the name of Lyman Cutler, uh, he he shot the Hudson's Bay pig who was uh, munching in his potato patch, and that flared up. And so both both sides, uh, the Americans and the British, established permanent military posts on the island, and they were here between 1859 to 19. To 1872, and it was a pretty amicable, friendly. There was a military road which they're trying to restore uh, between the two forts or two encampments. Uh, then there was, uh, you know, there was friendly uh, socialization back and forth between the American and British soldiers, and. Um, so, uh, and the, finally the two governments, wiser heads per, prevailed and they put the question of ownership up to arbitration and they uh, selected Emperor Wilhelm of, of uh, Germany to be the arbitrator and both sides presented their case. And in 1872, he decided that the main channel was indeed De Haro Strait and the San Juan Islands would belong to the American government. Um, and that's when uh, the settlers that had come here under the British, they hustled over to get American citizenship so that they could continue to live and prosper their lands. Um, farming was uh, big in the San Juans uh, up until, oh, I'd say the night, late uh, 50, 1950s, 60s. Uh, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, a lot of dairy. Um, uh, 
my my father actually was a butter maker and he worked at the cooperative dairy in Friday Harbor and they had uh, they shipped uh, they made they bought uh, they uh, brought in cream from uh, the islands uh, they had a, a pickup route on Lopez, which was very agricultural, on Orcas, on Shaw Island, and then the mail boat, uh, when there was a mail boat run, used to bring in cream and cans, cream cans, from the Otter Islands, Waldron, Stewart. <coughs> so that was a little way for people to, to make a living. Uh, so if you have dairy cattle, you have to have hay and you have to have grain to feed them. So there was haying and there was uh, uh, g barley and oats grown for, for uh, feed for the cattle and for the dairy cattle. And there was some beef too. Um, and so that, and then there was a considerable poultry, uh, I know, um, I remember my grandma and grandpa guard selling uh, cartons of eggs from their chickens to the University of Washington Marine Station out uh, at that time. It was it, where it is now. And I remember going out there with them as a little kid delivering it, carton of uh, boxes of eggs. Um, so agriculture was, was important. Um, uh, I remember, you know, they, my grandma and grandpa, my grandfather, um, guard, Harold guard, he farmed with draft horses, uh, up until his death. He, uh, he would, uh, you know, plow, disc, seed, cut hay, rake hay, haul, shock, well, shock hay, shocking hay is when you made it into piles and uh, then you let it dry in the field and then you had to come through with a trailer, horse-drawn trailer and load it onto the trailer and take it to the barn and pitch it into the hay mow and it was not an easy task. Uh, I've been watching on um, Facebook and, um, and uh, John and Rennie Wilson, they're in the process of getting in their hay and they've got tractors and big balers and big transporters and they can drive it right up to the barn. And I was thinking, wow, how times have changed. What takes a couple, three, four days used to take a month or more to get the hay in. And then, then they uh, had to, they had uh, threshing machines for the for the grain and uh, then they'd have to bring it in and put it through a, a process to clean it and, and then they have to grind it for their for their cattle I'm sure they didn't for their poultry they just threw whole grain so uh, another big employer a roach harbor at the north end of the island was blessed with a big um, a deposit limestone deposits and so uh, that was a major major employer for for many decades for the from uh, 1890 to 1960 roughly um, well that's it was sold uh, to the Tart family in 1956 57 and shortly thereafter the lime production stopped totally and it made a big dent in the employment of, uh, of, of San Juan Island. I know that in my class, I was the class of 1962 from Friday Arbor High School. We went from like 26, 27 to 18 in our senior year. And a lot of those moved because of, because of the closure of, of the lime works at Roach Harbor. And uh, so that was the uh, and then a lot of people and uh, people on San Juan and the other islands too, outer islands, they would cut wood into what they called cord wood. And that, uh, that was sold to Roach Harbor and that's what they used in the smelters to, 
to break down the limestone. Uh, so this, uh, the selling of cordwood uh, was, was a major economic activity for many on San Juan and particularly outer non-ferry items like Waldron and Stewart and uh, Henry Island. They, they sold cordwood to, to Roach Harbor to make, to make ends meet. A um, little bit about the schools. The first school on San Juan was at Bellevue, uh, what was that what is now Portland's, Portland Fairs. And that was the first school. The second school was on the um, number two schoolhouse road. Number two school, uh, I think number two meant the second school district on the island. And uh, that was on that road. Uh, my ancestors, the guards, lived in Beaverton Valley and they walked to the number two schoolhouse road. I have pictures of of my grandfather and his siblings in classes at number two schoolhouse road or schoolhouse. There was a schoolhouse um, on Boyce Road. Boyce Road goes out to the far end of San Juan Valley Road and then it tees into Boyce Road on the right and Wold Road on the left and down a ways into uh, uh, um, on the Boyce Road was a school, and that was real near my grandfather, my great grandfather Robert Sandmuth, who I'm named after. Uh, he he raised his family there on the intersection of uh, West Valley Road and Boyce Road, and he, so my grandfather Colin and his sisters walked, went to, to that school. And I, I want to point out that my grandfather, Colin Sandwith, uh, finished uh, high school as far as it went in 1907. And uh, I, I think he finished the 11th grade. And then he went on to Pullman uh, w, uh, or, uh, Washington State College and became a veterinarian and uh, practiced in Portland and then in Alaska and then Anacortes and then came back to San Juan and took over his parents' farm and or helped his parents. And unfortunately, he died of cancer in about 1936. But that was something for him to make that jump from a little one-room schoolhouse on Boyce Road to becoming a veterinarian. Uh, there was another school at Mitchell Bay, on the, uh, and then there was one at Roach Harbor that served the Roach Harbor community. And then on the Roach Harbor Road, there was a building, another school. It's still, that building was uh, there and it's still there. It's been remodeled into. Uh, it's on the where the wine uh, winery is there on Roach Harbor Road, and I think it's been made into like a wedding chapel or something. But but the this basic structure was a schoolhouse. Um. So let's see what else can I talk about. Um. Well, one of the things, I, I was an educator for, uh, like Mel said uh, in, in the introduction, for 34 years. I taught uh, history and English. And um, one of the things that we established in my last school that I taught at was a project called the Heritage Project. And where, uh, and this was at the grade eight. And... Uh, we took a, a couple of weeks and we um, focused on family history and the, and the students uh, made a, um, a um, big display board of their family history and there were certain criteria. And, and one of the things that it, that it promoted was uh, for them to talk to their grandparents and their relatives 
and to kind of a, get a sense of who they are and where they came from. I'm a firm believer that you have to know where you came from to know where you're going. And um, so um, we, we, we instituted that program and it went on for many, many years. And a lot of good stuff happened. And so what I'd like to encourage young people, if there's young people listening, is to establish a communication with, with their grandparents and their aunts and uncles and, and uh, talk to them about where they came from and, and their life. And, uh, and then uh, also, and this comes up all the time, if there's pictures, make sure that while people are still with us, that those picture, the people in the pictures are identified so that you don't end up someday with a whole stack of pictures that you don't know who the people were that, were, that are in the photos. So that's just kind of my little message. Um, now, I, I don't know if is there questions or uh, how, how do we proceed here? Bob, I, I like that message too about making sure you know who's in the pictures because that's we have already experienced that <laughs> <laughs> in our family. And it's been interesting. Like we've had so many people passing through. Everyone's being shy today though. So, and I have to say some of the people had a last name guard. There's a lot of those islands. Oh, well, let, let, me, let me just give you the rundown on the, the early families. That'd be great. I'll jump out. Okay. Right. okay. So uh, the earliest families were the McKay's, the Boyces were very early. The Flemings were very early. Uh, uh, Lawson's, Sandwis, uh, Chevaliers, um, Rulos. There's Rulo Road out uh, off of uh, Roach Harbor Road. Uh, and it's still, it's still owned in the Rulo name. And... Uh, it's still a functioning farm. Uh, in my day, I used to haul hay for Stan Rulo, and uh, he did uh, beef. Well, he did dairy. And then when that died out and the creamery in Friday Harbor closed down, he went to beef and he went to chickens. He at, uh, Right after World War II, he had his own milk route and sold milk to Roach Harbor store and and other customers on the north end of the island. Uh, so that's a, a continuous operating same family farm. And it's one of the last, I think, on San Juan Island. Uh, let's see who, uh, the Lawsons, did I say the Lawsons? The Boyces, uh, the Boyce Road, the Wold Road was an early family. Baylor, the Baylors, Baylor Hill Road, uh, that was, uh, they were big farmers in San Juan Valley and uh, their grandson, great grandson, great grandson, Frank Buchanan, he's still active and very knowledgeable about island history. Um, the guards, they were kind of late comers actually, 1889. Uh, so those are some of the early, early, uh, families on San Juan Island. Okay. You see, we have a question there um, from Robin. And she says, hi, Bob. What is a question that people rarely ask you, but you wish they would? Uh, let's see. What did people do for fun? Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to jump out. You talk about that. Well, you know, being, uh, m m they were hardworking people and uh, what they did for fun, uh, having big picnics, but their idea of a picnic, I have, a, uh, we, ha we used to have a family reunion every summer. And one, of, one year I put a, a, um, a, picture out on the invitation of the guards at a beach and they all had on 
uh, sport shirts and uh, long white sleeve shirts with ties, hats. The women would be in fancy dresses and they would be at the beach having this big picnic. And I thought, wow, that's uh, the times have changed. Um, they'd have dances. Uh, there were social clubs. Um, I know my grandma was, uh, my grandma Ethel. Oh, I want to talk about my grandma Ethel too. My, um, but anyway, grandma Ethel, she was in, uh, involved in a, in a woman's club. Uh, it was called the Beaverton Valley Woman's Club. My grandma Emily on the guard side, Harold Guard's wife, she started the first garden club on San Juan Island probably in about 1946 or something. They were great gardeners, great gardeners. And everybody had a garden because you, you had fruits and everybody had an orchard. And so you have lots of old farmhouses with orchards. Some of those trees are over a hundred years old. I want to talk about my grandmother. You know, we're, I think we're, uh, this is the year that the women nationally got the right to vote, 1920, when the, the amendment was passed, giving women the right to vote. Women got the right to vote in Washington state in 1912. And, um, my grandmother, Ethel May Perry, later Sandwith, she graduated from Friday Harbor High School as a four-year, the first four-year graduating uh, class from Friday Harbor High School was in 1912. And there were three women, my grandmother, uh, Amy, uh, I'm not going to remember her name, her married name was Boyce, and then a Mollus, one of the Mollus uh, in the family, Mollus family. So there was three women. And in 1912, she was she was 21, my grandmother, at that age. But she had, you know, every time they added a year to the high school, she would go back and finish, and and she worked around t at Friday Harbor, and so she was approached by people to run for county clerk of the court, county clerk, and uh, as a woman, and she filed and, and ran. And Robert Moran, who was the famed shipbuilder from Seattle who bought Rosario uh, on Orcas Island, in, uh, I'm not sure when he did it, 1905, something like that. He was well established on Orcas Island and he was a promoter of women's right to vote, women's suffrage. So he wrote to my grandmother and said, if you'll come to Orcas Island, I will uh, personally take you around all the little towns on Orcas, Crow Valley and Deer Harbor and West Sound and East Sound and Alga and Doe Bay. And so he did. And uh, they had the election in the fall of uh, November of 1912. And she carried Orcas Island and beat out her competitors and became the county clerk of San Juan County in 1912. And I thought that that was uh, pretty interesting. It's one of the earliest uh, females elected. Uh, it was the earliest in San Juan County and uh, probably, uh, you know, I'm not sure this, but there wasn't very few in the whole state of Washington. So that's it. That's a little. And um, she didn't run the next year because she fell in love and married Colin Sandworth, who was a veterinarian. And, and um, so she uh, didn't run. And and Robert Moran sent her a beautiful little, uh, her and her husband, uh, a beautiful little wedding present of a, of a silver candy dish. And I had that candy dish for many after my mother passed. And, and I, I recently gave it to my grandniece as a wedding present, uh, just in this history of it, so that she would know the history of where it came from. So that's a little plug for women's right to vote and early history in San Juan County.
I love that. That's good. You've like covered so many different things that I had absolutely no idea about here locally. That's really cool. And um, a couple of other people have joined in because it's so funny. Like now people are, um, we're just starting to get some more people joining in here. So if you have questions, for Bob, as while we have him here, um, you know, please do um, put some questions in the comments. You've been having a pretty impressive strolling audience here, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> People see you and go, hey, it's been a long time since I've seen Bob. What does he have to say? <laughs> and, I, and again, I really want to reiterate, and I know you mentioned this earlier, about the importance that you brought up about people reaching out to their families um, and and finding out their local history. You know, it's one of my funniest teaching stories that I love to share. Um, I won't share the student's name, but I think you know who it is. Um, but he was in seventh grade at the time and uh, I was doing my student teaching and a new student walked in who happened to be female and he was just like all over himself to say hello to this girl. He's like, oh, you know, it's like, and I was like, seriously, pull it together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I looked at him and I was like, you know, subtlety is good too. And he looked at me and he goes, do you know, at that time I was Vucic, do you know what my last name is, Miss Vucic? That means, and so he told me, and he goes, that means that I'm related to over half the people in this room. When fresh blood comes in, we get excited. <laughs> and he shared that with me as a seventh grader. It was so funny. I just absolutely, and so that's like one of those stories forever that I love. <laughs> and then I also had um, Lori Gard on one of our first field trips sat me down and she said, okay, because I was trying to understand as a newcomer to the island, like, right. like there's these guards and these sandwiths and Wilsons. And I was trying to understand the whole scope. I still don't understand it. But yeah. Lori was so great. She like busted out a piece of paper and just started <laughs> drawing branches and trees and, and all that kind of stuff. It was really cool. So I, if you are new to the island, take advantage of finding someone who knows local history and can kind of draw the map for you because you would be amazed. And I think it's a really cool testament of place. How many people have stayed around and how yeah. many people, how many families here are longtime Islanders? Yeah, yes, yeah. And are yeah. still here. Um, still so many guards and Wilsons and um, Sandwiths and, you know, um, all of those families are still very well, very well represented here. Yeah. You know, I didn't mention anything about the Valley Church. Mm. And, and that is an important thing. That Ooh, was I'll a, jump out. Go ahead. Okay. That was a uh, cooperative effort, much like the school, the first schoolhouse. Uh, people... Uh, felt a need. And I think there was eight people uh, in the committee. One of them was uh, Joseph Sen with my, let's see, my great, great, great grandfather. And uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know the, the name of the man that donated the land, but the Valley Church is still there. And they, uh, they, uh, were instrumental in the uh, building of it. And um, I am proud that it has continued to be a, um, uh, in, continued to be part of the history of San Juan Island. It was in bad shape. Uh, and eventually um, they created a taxing, junior taxing district. And uh, now, uh, it's part of the taxing district. And so the upkeep is, uh, is part of, of the cemetery board and, uh, their duties. And so it, it'll always be there. We used it, uh, 2017 for my youngest sister's 
memorial service and it was meant so it was so special for her for that uh, for for us to see that through the generations and to know that our forefathers had had a hand in, in being part of the organization of that and uh, so when i walk through the the cemetery um it's uh, i see lots of lots of people that uh were adults when I grew up, and, um, and and it's it's the names are so familiar, and it's uh, just like walking down memory lane. And every year, for many many years, I've always come to the island for uh, Memorial Weekend, and uh, we've always tended the the family graves. But I didn't do it this year because of the coronavirus. I just didn't think it was proper to travel. Okay, so Another I just Another wanted... great piece of our island history there. And you know, it's funny because you were mentioning the um the haying process and how that has changed over time. And uh somebody posted it, um Kelly Balcom Bartok actually I think was the original poster on it, but I just giggled because part of my kids growing up here is we joke about marshmallow season. <laughs> That is the big round bills with the plastic up. <laughs> yeah, he actually, he made a reference um, that was like, oh, it's marshmallow season. And I'm like, oh, that's so funny because that's totally a thing in our family too. It's like, oh, it's marshmallow season, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Rennie did a great job of. Um, you know, she would be a good resource to talk about. I am trying to get her on here, Rennie, if you're <laughs> out there. I have asked, I adore her, and I have asked her probably five times. And she's like, oh, what would I share? I'm well, like, she oh, could share how to can and how to pay. And <laughs> Oh, my gosh. She's an endless wealth yeah. of information. Yeah. On and how, to, how to raise good kids. And <laughs> isn't that the truth? Yeah. Oh, isn't that the truth? Yeah. No, we. I, and John, her husband, Wilson, he he's a good historian. He's a good local historian. Yeah. He. he I mean, just in his memory, he he's, he's got great memory. Oh, so see, I might have to tap him too. And <laughs> here's another question that just came from Robin. She said, did your grandparents ever talk about the dances that lasted all night? Like almost until dawn, she's read about those. Yeah, I don't think, uh, maybe my mom and dad's generation, but I don't think my grandparents so much. Uh, uh the guards, you know, it was hard work, and uh, the sand was not so much. I think my dad, my dad's generation, my mom's generation, and uh, that generation probably were more into dances and parties and that stuff. Not so much my grandparents, I don't think. That's a that's an interesting. And so, Robin, thanks for asking that. That's a good question. There is this the Robin from the museum. Um, you know, that's a really good question. It just says Robin Forrest Jacobson. So I'm not sure. And I don't know Robin personally. <laughs> so Robin, maybe you can answer that for us if, if you're, uh, if you're still in there. So, um, perhaps she is, I'm not sure. Let's see. And I can't, nope, I'm not seeing her in there. Um, she hasn't responded, so maybe she will give us a response. If you know, a, a couple of good books that I'd like to, to recommend about um, uh, I well, not necessarily about the San Juans. Mm -hmm. I, I think the quintessential book about the San Juans for me is "Living High" by June Burns. Such uh, a good book, and 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 it's got so much the feel of the San Juans in the twenties and thirties, and her husband, they were they homesteaded. The, probably one of the last homesteads in San Juan County was on Sentinel Island, just just near Spiden Island. And uh, he rode back and forth to Roach Harbor to work, and you know caught codfish and sold them in Roach Harbor. Rowing. I just imagine I that I read that book when I first came up here, 
And I just imagined him with like shoulders, right? Like, and like this tiny little waist because rowing every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's see. Um, oh, and Robin responded, that's me. Yes, I volunteer there and I'm board president this year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I, 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 I recognized your name because whenever I comment on something historical, on San Juan on Facebook. I, I, I recognize that name. Another one is Julie Stein's uh, archeology span book about the San Juans. It's called Exploring Coastal Salish Prehistory, the Archeology span of San Juan Island. And that's very good about uh, native stuff. Very, very- Okay, uh, and so I'm gonna capture these two titles again. <laughs> I know for sure if you go to um i'm copying the and it's in its third edition right now of a living high um by june birds great book i'm putting that into the comments and then i'm also what was the second one that you mentioned bob uh julie stein s-t-e-i-n okay she's at the burke museum in seattle and it's exploring coastal salish prehistory okay and so i will Put both of those in the, let's see, I'll put both of those in the comments. And, and, then, and then this has nothing to do with San Juan Island locally, but it has such the flavor of the seasons and the rain and the cold of the winter is Betty McDonald's The Egg and I. I, I think that if you're a Northwesterner, you should have read that. Okay. By Betty McDonald? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've got those all written down. There's, um, oh no, no, I just forgot the name of it. It's um, not about the islands in particular, but it's a woman who took her kids. Oh, uh, yeah, I know, on the boat. Yes, and she uh, took them up into the passage. Yeah, I can't think of it. I'll find that one too. That's a great. That's a great book. That's, that's a, great a really, book. really good book. And there's, it's funny. There's um, one thing I love kind of going back to June Burns' book. Um, her use of language is so good. Her descriptive writing is hysterical. And there's, I remember that there's just that one scene where they're sitting on Gumdrop Island, right? Yeah. And um, and her husband went to get, I think he went fishing and he ended up getting an octopus and oh, thought yeah. that it was like this really fabulous idea to <laughs> grab this octopus. And um, it ended up in the hole of his, and he was like wrestling it. <laughs> and she was standing up on the hill, just like going, oh my God, just like, what are you doing? You know, and then it ended up not tasting great either. Um, yeah. But then the thing that was funny to me was that the Chevaliers were like standing on the side of the hill watching yeah. it all happen. They were, and they, they lived on Spiden Island. <laughs> yeah, and they were on Spiden. So it was really funny because just the way she wrote that, if you're watching this right now, get that book. And she's just so colorful in her language and, um, and her storytelling skills. Yeah. She's, it's really a fabulous book, a really great read. And um, so, yeah. I recommend that one. Highly the recommend. Chevaliers are, are uh, a, a very great family. Long, long ties in San Juan, and and uh, uh, it encompasses both Native American and European. And it's great, great, great family, and great, great contributions to the history and and, and lore of San Juan Islands. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Well. What a treat, Bob. If anybody has any more questions for Bob, please, please ask them while I've got him here. Um, we've got a really great audience for you today, which I'm so grateful. Thank you for everybody who has checked in here. And um, before we head out, if you can just drop any, we've got, um, we've got him here. He's here right now. He's living in Port Townsend right now. But man, we've got him on camera right now. So if you have any questions for Bob, just drop those in. And um, oh, Jenny just said, hi, Uncle Bob. Jenny? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, Jenny. She's <laughs> my great, great niece. No. Yes. Is that right? No, she's my great niece. Just great. And her daughter is my great, great niece, Thea. Mm. <laughs> and so for those of you... <laughs> <laughs> so, and Jenny, I was just telling a story about your mom drawing out the the family tree, <laughs> and that's it right there, Bob. Like that's what you were saying. It's like I think she's my great great niece. Like <laughs> it's totally the island way. It's like if you're not like third cousin once removed, <laughs> and, it's, and it's really funny because I have to tell you that as somebody who grew up on the mainland, nobody talks about like that's my great great cousin or my great niece and or you know fifth cousin twice removed like nobody has a sense of who those people are in their family so coming here it was so great because everybody's just like on the family tree (laughs) (laughs) it's really good and it's such a cool connection here as well i mean um i witnessed it through the schools for years and just seeing um, you know, and you know, here's another place that you see it play out all the time here. That is like island magic to me is on the sports fields. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. You have aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody coming Grandparents out. Grandparents and yeah, yeah. The works. Everybody comes out to. It's a focus. Them. It's a focus. It's a focus. Yeah. Yeah. It is for sure. And it's really great. And it's, it's cool. It has been for a long time. I mean, Friday Harbor had base. I have old pictures of 1909 and of baseball teams from Friday Harbor. Uh, and it's great. Yeah. yeah. They used to, Roach Harbor used to have a team, Friday Harbor, Port Townsend, Orca, or East Sound. Uh, there was kind of a league way back when. So, and that was a really a, 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 a distraction from from work and and from the, you know, they had to work hard, and uh, they didn't get to play very much. And so, yeah. yeah, but it's always good. Everybody comes with a cheering squad. I think yeah. a cheering yeah. section. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty great. So, well, Bob, I'm going to wrap it up here. But thank you so. Much. I have one quick question. Ooh. How many do you have a count of how many people were on? Oh my gosh. Now you're asking me statistical questions. Let me see if I can find that out for you. Let me see. We have had, let me see if I can get to the original link here. Now you're testing my, my tech skills live. So um, let's see. I want to make sure it doesn't start talking. See, Oh, there it is. See, I knew that was going to happen. It was going to start going live and you know what? I can't pull it up. While we're live, but as soon as we're off, I'll be able to tell you because that's okay. oddly how it works. Um, but Do you have yeah. another question? Um, let me see. Let me see there. Um, oh, it just says it's from Robin, and she says, Thank you, Val and Bob. This was fun. Oh, tell her thank you. Yeah, well, you can tell her because you're right there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Robin. I need to stop into the museum, and I have a bunch of pictures that I want to. Um, give to the museum and uh, and I'm actually in the process for my for my nieces and nephews of writing our family history and uh, I'll make sure that uh, the museum gets a copy and the other thing that I want to uh, give to the museum or get to the museum I, I'm not in possession but I'm working on it my grandma Ethel her maiden name was Perry and her mother, Laura Baker Perry, ran a birthing center where um, it's now part of the Spring Street School. It's the the little house that has the bric-a-brac on the front porch. And that was a birthing center. And she was she was in business there for probably a decade. And she brought a lot of people and she kept a very meticulous journal of of the births that she was uh, the midwife for. And That's so that cool. I never knew that was the history of that building. And so uh, she, I want to get that journal and give it to the museum because that's where it belongs. That is so cool. Yeah. 
And Robin said, we will open for you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been a delight. And thank you, Val, for asking me to do this. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Bob. It was just awesome. And if anybody, if you're watching after the fact, and if you have questions in the feed, I will make sure to get those questions to Bob and do a response there. Um, and Robin said, we can't wait <laughs> for you to come out there. So um, so thank you so much for being here and you hold tight and I'll be with you in just one second. And everybody watching, thank you so much for joining us today. What an amazing crowd we had here for Bob. I love that. And um, it's so important for us to be able to capture our local history and different perspectives. And um, even though Bob is not here, so he is an Islander forever, for sure. Um, so thank you for watching another episode of Friday Harbor Live. Remember to keep listening and learning. And tomorrow I will be here with Shona. She has a really fun activity for kids called Happy Feet. So um, that's, and that's Shona from Wolf Hollow. So join us tomorrow at 1030. Should be a lot of fun. See you later. Bye-bye.